Good afternoon, all. My name is Reem Henry, an area uh, coordinator for Ireland and Perforating in Halliburton, Egypt. Welcome to our last session for today. We're having a very, a very distinguished speaker addressing an interesting topic, the very famous catastrophic Macondo blowout. Uh, please help me welcome Mr. John Turley, who uh, taught petroleum engineering at Marietta College in the U.S. before joining Marathon Oil Company, where he served as Gulf Coast Drilling Manager, UK Operations Manager, Manager of Worldwide Drilling, and Vice President Engineering and Technology. He holds a professional degree in petroleum engineering from Colorado School of Mines, an MS degree in ocean engineering from the University of Miami and an executive management degree from Harvard. After he retired, John independently researched the 2010 Macondo blowout and examined the engineering cause of BP's Macondo blowout ab aboard the Transocean Deepwater Horizon. He has spoken on the topic to numerous technical, academic, and industry audi audiences around the world, including uh, 2015-16 SPE Distingu Distinguished Lecture. John, we can't wait for you to share your findings of the root cause with uh, the Macondo. The mic is yours. Thank you, Reem, for that uh, very kind introduction. Uh, I appreciate that. And I really do appreciate uh, being invited to make uh, this presentation uh, by Dr. Algari and, and uh, with respect to Pio Petro and the Arab Oil and Gas Academy, and to all of you guys out there in the audience. When I say guys, I say I'm talking about men and women uh, out there in the audience from colleges and universities around the world. Uh, I really appreciate you taking interest in this topic because it certainly is important to me. You might wonder how I got involved in this topic. The blowout occurred 10 years ago in April, and shortly thereafter, my friends and neighbors and relatives all came to me and said, John, you're the expert. What happened to that rig in the Gulf? And I can tell you, I gave the best answer I could give. My answer was, I don't know, because I did not know. And the only information I could get was from the media, from attorneys, from television, from radio, from newspapers, and everything I read was basically garbage. And Nothing really told me what happened, what caused the problem. And based on my career experience, I decided that I would look into all the data that I could find just to satisfy myself. I got hooked up with depositions that were being given or being taken by the U.S. Coast Guard of the survivors. And what I noticed was, if you think about a pyramid, the hierarchy of people on the rig with the leadership at the top and those with lesser responsibilities at the bottom, the Coast Guard started deposing people at the bottom of the pyramid. And I noticed that right off. I thought, wow, that was a good question, but this guy doesn't know anything about the answer. So what can we learn from that? Well, I learned as the days and weeks went on, there were 100 people deposed and about 100 pages of depositions each. And by the way, that's 10,000 pages of depositions. And every time a, a senior person was flashed a document and said by the Coast Guard would say, I see your signature at the bottom of this page. Did you have anything to do with this document? Yes. Well, every time they had one of those documents, and it might be a procedure for running casing or a procedure for cementing a string of casing. I would download that. So I download the depositions, I download the documents. So I got hold of everything I could and, and I decided I was gonna look into the data that allowed me to understand the cause of the blowout. And that's why the name of this talk is Assessing and Applying Petroleum Engineering Data from the 2010 Macondo Blowout. So let's go to the next slide and uh, we'll take a look at the well um, from uh, um, the pre-spud plan for the well. Actually, what we're seeing is, 
is uh, an exploration well in the Gulf of Mexico, and it was spotted in 2009. Guys, that's a long time ago. Think of your age right now today. Now think of how old you were 10 years ago. Uh, I know I was a lot younger, um, but this could be a 20,000 foot well in about a mile of water. Uh, I call it a mile of water. It's not quite 5280, but it's a mile of water. And there's a geologic structure on the seismic that they were interested in enough to spend tens of millions of dollars to drill this exploration well. And the structure was called Macondo. And that's why we call it the Macondo well. The target depth for the structure was below 17,000 feet. So they were approved to go to 20, but the target depth was below about 17,000 feet. Now on this next slide, you can see that up here at the top of the picture is uh, the floating drilling rig, the deep water horizon. The, okay, so that's where we are. We're all up to speed now on which slide we're on. We see the deep water horizon floating in 5,000 feet of water. Now, one of the things interesting, interesting, interesting about the floating rig is there are no anchors. It is dynamically positioned. It is hovering above the wellhead, kind of like a helicopter hovering above a parking lot. Because it's hovering in space and has no anchors, the US Coast Guard considers it to be a vessel at sea. And therefore, the Coast Guard has a captain on board. The captain has nothing to do with the rig, has nothing to do with the drilling of the well, but he's there because he's concerned and in charge of this vessel floating out there in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. And that's why the Coast Guard are the people who took the depositions that I first got hold of when I talked about it earlier. So now we have this well, we've got the rig is connected to the BOPs by a, a drilling riser, it's 21 inch diameter, it holds about 1500 barrels of, of mud, setting on top of the BOPs, the BOPs are very large, they're 13 5 8 15,000 pound BOPs, there are two 10,000 pound annulars, uh, there's a blind shear ram, a casing shear ram, three variable bore rams, and those are setting on top of the well head. Below the well head, we've got several strings of, of casing. Of course, we started off with, with very heavyweight structural casing, and by the time we get interested in this well, we're down here, that first big blue arrow that points to 17,000 foot feet where we have a nine and seven eighths liner set at 17,000 feet. When they drilled below that liner during the next thousand feet, things got interesting. First, they discovered a high pressure stringer that needed heavy mud, 14.2 pounds per gallon. They would have actually liked to have used heavier mud than 14.2, but they had lost circulation zones below the stringer. So here the mud wants to take 14 and a half pound per gallon mud, but the stringer needs at least 14.2. So they settled on 14.2 and finished drilling the well with 14.2 pound per gallon mud because if they went any heavier, they'd lose circulation. They did discover a 200 foot thick pay zone from about 18,000 feet to 18,200 feet. In that pay zone, a good oil prospect, a good oil discovery, they realized that their 14.2 pound per gallon mud created a hydrostatic head about a thousand PSI, a thousand PSI, more hydrostatic head than the pressure in the discovery zone. So there's no, no fear of that well flowing because it's so overbalanced. They continued drilling to about 18,360 feet and they needed that that uh, extra footage, first of all, they wanted to make sure they didn't find any pay 50 feet below the 200 foot zone. They could have found 10 feet, five feet, 50 more feet, but they drilled more shale, more shale. They drilled enough hole. They had 136, 100, 160 feet of extra hole below the bottom of the pay. Now let's go to the next slide. 
is upper left hand corner says diagram 16. This shows what they did when they, after fully evaluating the pay zone, I mean, they ran every well log you can imagine, pressure test. Uh, they wanted to know what was down there because you've just drilled a well that cost well over a hundred million dollars and you found a discovery, you definitely want to know what's in the rocks down there, what kind of floods are down there, what kind of pressure regime. So they got all that data, now it's time to run cement or run casing and cement in place. So because of the, the fact that 17,000 feet, they had a nine and seven eighths liner, they couldn't go nine and seven eighths all the way. So they actually had a tapered string, nine and seven eighths casing, on top of seven inch casing that went down through the previous string of casing, stuck out the bottom. So we've got seven inch casing that went down to, um, there's a depth on this somewhere, uh, within 56 feet of bottom and below that, we call that rat hole. In other words, the casing did not go to the bottom of the hole. And there's a reason for that. When you were running that casing, it has a casing hanger up near the BOP that has got to land in the casing head and therefore the casing hanger and the attached casing are hanging from the casing hanger. And we want that to happen before the bottom of the casing gets to the bottom of the hole. If you inadvertently run an extra joint of casing and then you're running your long string of nine and seven eighths by seven inch production casing and it inadvertently hits the bottom of the hole before the casing hanger gets to the casing head then you're really going to have a bad day when you call your boss and say you've got to pull all that casing out of the hole and since when you pull casing you got to break the connections that means all that pipe has to be shipped back to town to have the connections redressed before you can rerun it in the well with one less joint of pipe. You don't want to have to do that. So we have rat hole down there and that's going to play a significant role in the rest of our discussion. That rat hole is not unimportant. What they cemented this casing with is notice that second blue arrow, there's a float collar installed uh, about in the middle of the pay zone and that float collar has two high pressure check valves in it. And those high pressure check valves are designed to make sure nothing can ever flow up the casing. Now, when you run the casing though, you need the casing to fill with mud as you're running it in the well bore. So the float collar has high pressure check valves in it, but when you install the float collar on the rig, it has a blocking mechanism inside the flow collar that makes sure the check valves are blocked open. So when you run the casing, the casing can fill with mud. Now, in order to get those check valves to actually perform as high pressure check valves, we have to do what we call convert the flow collar. And that is a matter of pumping, in this case, about six barrels a minute either of mud or cement through that flow collar. Once you get more than six barrels a minute, you will convert the flow collar to be a check valve so nothing can come up the hole. So we've got the flow collar installed. We've got 180 feet of casing below the flow collar. And then we've got the rat hole. And then up around the side, we're going to cement that with, with class H cement followed by some nitrified cement. That's where we're actually mixing nitrogen bubbles with the cement to give it a lower density. And we're gonna follow that cement, which is all in the annulus, with some more class H cement to make sure we've got good, uncontaminated class H cement in the 180 foot shoe track. That's the third arrow, arrow down. So that shoe track has good class H cement in it that is not contaminated by the annulus. And below that is the rat hole. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. And at the top of this slide, it says, after the casing and cement job, we need to look at temporary abandonment. Now, let's ask ourselves, wh what is this temporary abandonment? Why are we looking at temporary abandonment? 
we just made a discovery. Why don't we produce the oil and gas? Well, because this is a deep offshore environment and there's a lot of work to be done in the next two, three, four, or five years in preparation for first oil. We've got to turn this over to the subsea guys, the mechanical engineers. They've got to design all the subsea equipment in a mile of water to get it shallow enough to finally get it to a platform that is setting out there where we can have pumps, et cetera, installed. So it's going to take a long time. We have to drill delineation wells. All we know, know is that we have a discovery at the location of the Maconda well with 200 feet of pay, but how big is it? How far north, east, south, west does it go? Now the seismic guys, the geophysicists, have to go back and look at their map and say, oh, you discovered this pay zone right here. And yes, look there at that reflection on the seismic. What is the extent of it? And then the geologists get involved we, and the reservoir engineers, we need to drill more wells, assess the size of this development. And therefore, two, three, four, five years from now, we're finally going to be able to produce this. But in the meantime, that means we need to make sure our well, the Maconda well, is secure through temporary abandonment, and then we can release the rig and come back a year or two later. So we need to prepare the rig for abandonment. What, do we, what does that mean? Well, it happens that this rig is drilling the well with oil-based mud. The next well they go to, the operator has an obligation and a plan and a schedule. As soon as they get done with the Maconda well, they're going to move the rig over to another well, and that well is full of water-based mud. So they've got, got to get rid of all the oil-based mud on the deep water horizon so they can go to the next well. Well, that means they've got a lot of work to do on the rig, preparing it just to be able to leave location. Now, relative to the well, we need, well, we need to make sure it is pressure secure so we can leave it for one or more years before another rig comes back. We're actually going to do two tests. Two tests on the well bore, this casing that we set, the cement that's in the well. We're going to do a positive pressure test and we're going to do a negative pressure test. And those tests are designed to make sure there are no leaks. The positive pressure test is designed to ensure there are no leaks from inside the casing to outside the casing. The negative pressure test is designed to make sure there's no leaks from the outside in and is also designed to make sure that when the rig leaves location and takes the BOPs and the riser with it, that we've lost 5,000 feet of heavy mud that was exerting pressure on the bottom of the well and we're gonna replace that with seawater. We have to make sure we can do that safely. We're also gonna install a device called a lockdown seal ring. Now we've run the casing. It has a casing hanger that's, hasing, that's hanging in the casing head and all the casing is hanging below that casing hanger. But it's just hanging there by gravity. So we've got a device called a lockdown seal ring that is designed to be run in the well bore. We have to have, in this case, a, a string of 5,000 feet of drill pipe with the lockdown seal ring attached on the bottom, just so we can run it down through the riser and get it down to the casing head. Once we get down to the casing hanger, we can install the lockdown seal ring, lock it into place, make sure it's tight, make sure it's sealed, release the work string, pull it out of the hole. Now, the casing is locked in place. It can never move. No matter how much pressure you exert below it, it'll never be lifted out of the casing hanger. We're also going to set and test a cement plug. Now, we've got that flow collar down there with check valves. We've got cement in the annulus. We've got 160 feet of shoe track full of Class H cement. So this well is pretty secure, but we're going to set another cement plug. We're going to set it below the mud line, down in the well bore, 300 feet of cement. We're going to give it plenty of time to harden. We're going to go in with a bit. We're going to drill on it, make sure it's hard as a tombstone. And then we're ready to continue with our abandonment procedure. The next step would be to get all that oil-based mud out of the riser. It holds 1,500 barrels of mud. It's oil-based mud. We cannot dump that in the Gulf of Mexico. So before we pull the BOPs in the riser, we have to 
pump seawater down into the well to lift the oil-based mud out of the riser and capture the oil-based mud in the pits on the rig so we can pump it down to a boat to take it to town to dispose of it. So that's displacing the riser with seawater. We're gonna do that after we make sure the well is secure. Then we're gonna pull the BOPs in the riser, which have no more mud in them, and therefore the riser gets hung up on the riser racks on the rig, and the BOPs get pulled up and set on the rig, and now we are ready to release the rig and it can go off to its next location. Well, there was a little problem because while we were displacing the riser with seawater, the well blew out. What? How can that happen? We prepared this well for testing. We ran a positive test. We ran negative pressure test. We installed the lockdown seal ring. We set a cement plug that nothing can flow through. We did all that, and while displacing the riser with seawater, the well blew out. Guys, we need to go back and look at some data. Something drastically wrong. That should not have happened. Look at this picture behind me. I think you can see it. This is actually what happened. That's the deep water horizon the day after the well blew out. So let's go to the next slide. The one that says diagram 22 in the upper left-hand corner. So we just saw this slide a little while ago. See that the big blue arrow at top shows the float collar. And below that, the cement in the shoe track. And below that, the rat hole. Well, let's investigate this just a little in a little more depth. The float collar may have some mechanical damage. If the well actually blew out, we had to have some way for the oil and gas to get up the casing. Now, right above that. Uh, top arrow, you can see the top of the cement in the annulus, and notice right above that, that the top of the cement is below the bottom of the previous nine and seven eighths liner. So the annulus is open all the way up to the casing head. So there was some concern early on that the blowout may have come up the outside of the casing. But we are going to show, and we have plenty of reason to believe, that the flow actually came up the casing, which means, huh, there has to be something wrong with the flow collar. It's got high pressure check valves in it. When you go back and look in detail at the data for the casing and semen job, you realize that after they got done logging the well and they made a bit trip and they circulated bottoms up, or at least they were supposed to, though they cut it dramatically short, while they were circulating, they needed to pump more than six barrels a minute in order to activate the float collar. Now that float collar actually I made a mistake right there. You, there was a bit trip after we logged the well and we circulated bottoms up. When we ran the casing, we were required to circulate bottoms up again. That circulation job should have included some portion of time where we were pumping more than six barrels per minute so that the float collar could be converted. Yet records show at no time while pumping mud for the through, down through the casing, or while pumping cement down through the casing, did we ever go over 4.1 pounds per gallon? 4.1 is not as big as six. It takes six to convert the float collar. 4.1 did not convert the float collar. So even today in 2020, the float collar is still open. Okay, so we, now we know we don't have any check valve in the float collar. So there's a contributor to our possible problem or a possible contributor. Now let's look at that cement underneath the float collar. That's that 180 feet of shoe track cement, 16.7 pound per gallon class H cement, uncontaminated. All you did is mix it at the cement unit, pump it down the casing, through the float collar, and it stopped inside the shoe track, and we gave it plenty of time to set up. 
that should be hard as a patio. But there's a problem. If you look at the bottom of the well, notice that the mud in the rat hole is 14.2 pounds per gallon. Now, if you can imagine having dinner with a little container of oil and vinegar, what happens to the oil and vinegar if it sits there for a while? Well, guess what? All the oil goes to the top, all the vinegar goes to the bottom, the vinegar's heavier, the oil is lighter, so you shake it up and put it on your salad. Well, look at the 14.2 pound per gallon mud setting underneath 16.7 pound per gallon cement, and what do you think happens? You get gravity segregation. The lightweight mud climbs up through the heavyweight cement. Have you ever seen a lava lamp? That's these pretty little devices that have blobs of different colors that, that heat up. The density goes down, the blob rises and falls, and you get exchange of these little blobs back and forth. Well, we just, we have the most expensive lava lamp in the world right here. There's no lights, but that 14.2 pound per gallon mud is on the way up the outside of the casing, because that's also 16.7 class H cement at the bottom. And inside the shoe track, we've got mud climbing up. So we have just contaminated the cement outside the casing and inside the casing. Well, fortunately, a, a malfunctioning float collar should not take away from the fact that this well bore is full of 14.2 pound per gallon mud, which is a thousand PSI overbalanced compared to the formation. So the well's not flowing. Even if the float collar is not working, the well's not flowing. Even if the, the cement and the shoe track is contaminated by the mud from the rat hole, the well's still overbalanced and it's not flowing. So these are actually static leaks. They're invisible to the people on the rig. Let's go to the next slide. It says diagram 18 in the upper left-hand corner. I need to check one thing here. So fortunately, we're back online. Fortunately, these are static leaks. And the good news is we're going to perform tests to make sure nothing is leaking. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at a negative pressure. Actually, let's do the positive pressure test first. We're going to pressure up on the casing to 2,700 PSI to make sure there are no leaks from the inside out. Now, when we ran that cement, there was a bottom plug and a top plug. We run the bottom plug ahead of the cement slurry. We follow that with the top plug. The bottom plug wipes the, the casing clean so that the cement goes down clean casing on its way to the annulus. The top plug, which sets on top of the, the last bit of cement slurry, is the demarcation between the cement underneath and the mud on top. So now as we pump continued, continue pumping mud, the top plug goes down, pushes the cement ahead of it, and when the top plug gets down to the flow collar, it happens to be as solid as a rock, and that float, that top cement plug lands on the flow collar and becomes a blockade for any additional pumping. So nothing else can be pumped down this well because that top plug is blocking any downward flow of mud. So now we can pressure up on top of the top plug and our pressure, 2,700 PSI, is gonna be exerted against the entire casing string all the way down to the float collar. Well, that's good 
because there were no leaks. So we got a good positive pressure test. Now we're going to do the negative pressure test. Now, now on this diagram 18, this is the setup for the negative pressure test. It's important to look at the three diagrams and realize that there's some hours in between. The diagram on the left, uh, it says di this, we're on diagram 18. There's three pictures of the well bore. The one on the left shows the rig, the riser, and the BOP, and the fact that the well bore, the riser, and the well bore is completely full of 14.2 pound per gallon heavy mud, exerting a thousand psi overbounds. Now skip to the picture on the right. The picture on the right shows that the rig, riser, and BOP have been removed. Well, what about the heavy mud that was in the riser? It's going to go away. Since it's going to go away, it no longer exerts hydrostatic head. So we've lost 5,000 feet of heavy mud and replaced it with 5,000 feet of water. And therefore, we are no longer 1,000 PSI overbalanced at the bottom of the well. Well, we better make sure we can do that and that nothing flows when we reduce that pressure. So that's what the negative pressure test is. In order to do that, let's look at the middle picture. The minimum requirement for the negative pressure test is to put 5,000 feet of water in the top of the well bore, and we will talk about that more on the next slide. We need to replace the upper portion of the well bore with water in a simulation, in a simulation of removing that much mud. We do that in this case for what we call negative pressure test number one, we're gonna call it NPT1. Notice they ran a, a long string of drill pipe down through the riser, down through the BOPs and into the well bore. And in fact, they ran it to 8,367 feet and they filled that drill pipe with water. Now, when they filled that drill pipe with water, the rest of the well board didn't even know what's happening because the riser is still full of heavy mud, the BOP is still full of heavy mud, everything below the BOP is full of heavy mud, and you just happen to have a straw setting in the well bore that's full of water. But then we close the BOPs, and now everything from everything down to 8367 feet loses the effect of heavy mud and it's replaced by seawater. And we have just reduced the bottom hole pressure and that's gonna be the negative pressure test. So let's go to the next slide and look at a little more detail. Okay, it says diagram 18 at the top. The blue line has been added to the previous slide to show the kill line. The kill line is part of the well control system. The kill line we have kill lines and choke lines, all kinds of lines going back and forth up alongside the riser to the rig. But we're going to utilize the kill line because it just happens to go from the rig down alongside the riser, around the outside of the BOP, into the bottom of the BOP, and we can fill that with seawater. And that would mean, and then close the BOPs, and therefore the well would see 5,000 feet of water in the kill line and the rest of the well bore full of heavy mud, and that would reduce significantly the bottom hole pressure, and that would be a um, negative pressure test. Let's go to the next slide. This is a hand-drawn graph of the top half of the graph is the pressure at the cement unit that is tied to the drill pipe, the kill line, etc. And we're running that drill pipe, that long string of drill pipe, down through the riser, down through the BOPs. And as we run it, notice how the pressure on the drill pipe increases from zero to 2400 psi and that is nothing but YouTube. We've, we've got 
8367 feet of drill pipe with seawater on the inside and heavy mud on the outside. And that heavy mud is causing a YouTube effect and trying to push that seawater back up the drill pipe. And therefore, we read 2400 PSI at the surface. And then the light blue shaded area shows where we close the BOPs. Oh, wait, before we close the BOP, look at the bottom half of the graph. When we ran the drill pipe and we got more and more back pressure from the U-tube, notice the bottom hole pressure, which is the head of the 14.2 pound per gallon mud, the heavy mud, that never changed. It didn't, the bottom of the hole didn't care that we ran drill pipe. It still got a full well bore of 14.2 mud. Even as we pump seawater into that drill pipe, the bottom of the well does not know that, and therefore it stayed fully hydrostatic head, fully 1,000 PSI overbalance. But now when we close the BOPs, that's the light blue area, and we start bleeding off the 2,400 PSI for every 100 PSI you bleed off the drill pipe, the pressure throughout the entire well bore is reduced by 100 PSI. Notice the red line is decreasing at the surface, the blue line is decreasing down hole. As we bleed off that 2400 PSI, look what happens to the pressure in the bottom of the well bore. It goes from 13,500 PSI down to 12,500 PSI, which just happens to be the reservoir pressure, but we keep bleeding it off. We keep bleeding and bleeding and bleeding until we have no more pressure on the drill pipe. We've reduced it 2,400 PSI and therefore reduced the bottom hole pressure by 2,400 PSI. And now, instead of being 1,000 PSI overbalanced, we're 1,400 PSI underbalanced. All we have to do is hold that for 30 minutes. And that is a, as good a negative pressure test as we can ever have, as we can ever have. Unfortunately, and I'm going to show this in more detail, unfortunately, while they were bleeding, the 2400 PSI off the drill pipe, and while coincidentally the bottom hole pressure was going down, 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 unfortunately, right before they got to zero, they had a problem with the bleeding off of the drill pipe. Therefore, they declared negative pressure, negative pressure test number one, NPT1, anomalous. They aborted the test. And they said, let's go to NPT2 instead. We'll use the kill line. We don't know why that pressure was anomalous. We'll just go to NPT2. So let's go to the next slide. Now here's the same depiction when instead of having 80, 83, 67 feet of drill pipe full of seawater, we've got 5,000 feet of kill line. And as they filled that kill line with seawater, it created a YouTube effect just like it did on the drill pipe. So as they filled the 5,000 foot kill line with seawater, they ended up with 1,450 PSI of YouTube effect on the kill line. But notice at the bottom of the well, the bottom hole pressure is still 13,500 PSI. It hasn't been affected. It hasn't changed. And then once again, we close the, B, the, close, close the BOPs. And when you close the BOP and bleed off the 1450 PSI on the kill line, the bottom hole pressure goes down 1,450 PSI. And by the time we get it completely bled down to zero, the reservoir pressure of 12,500 PSI is looking at a well bore that is 450 PSI underbalanced. So this is a viable negative pressure test. In fact, when they bled the 1450 off the kill line and held it at zero for 30 minutes, they declared the negative pressure test to be successful and they went about their business. 
So let's go to the next slide. This chart was first published when the operator made public their internal investigation on 8 September 2010. This chart was very significant to my understanding of what happened because it was in this very well done document made public by the operator. And this chart showed the pressures involved with the first negative pressure test and with the second negative pressure test. So we're going to look at this in more detail because from this chart, it's not obvious why NPT1 was declared anomalous, and it's not obvious why NPT2 was declared good. So let's look at it in more detail. Let's go to the next slide, which is going to be an expanded view of this slide. Okay. The sequence of events is as follows. We are going to reduce that U-tube pressure on the drill pipe. The 2400 PSI on the drill pipe, we're going to reduce it to zero. In fact, I hate to do that. Let's just go, let's just back up one minute on the slide, back up to the previous slide. Okay. Notice the green line that's labeled NPT1. Everything to the left of that was preparation for NPT1. As part of the preparation, they had to close the BOPs, the annular BOP around the drill pipe because they were going to reduce the pressure underneath the drill pipe, underneath the, the annular BOP. Now, most BOPs, all BOPs are designed to withstand high pressure underneath them. The annular, in this case, is going to be used just the opposite. We're going to reduce the pressure under the annular. And there's a, there's a procedure that involves the closing pressure on the annular. The annular is like a big donut. You fill it full of fluid and the donut pressures up and pushes against the pipe and you seal it. That's an annular BOP. Well, in this case, when they closed the annular BOP around the drill pipe and started reducing the, the, that U-tube pressure on the drill pipe, the closing pressure was not tight enough and therefore the heavy mud above the BOP leaked past the annular down the well bore and pushed mud and seawater back up the drill pipe. So they had to abort and then kind of start over again, increase the closing pressure on the annular and try it again. That's why you're seeing these up and down pressures uh, on the left side of that chart. They had to do that two or three times to get the closing pressure just right on the annular. And you don't want to just overpressure the annular because then you can rupture the, the bladder and, and you cause more trouble than you want. So they finally got the correct closing pressure and that allowed them to get into the NPT1 pressures. And now we can go to the, the next chart. Okay. So there's that same chart just blown up a little bit larger. These, uh, uh, the pressure increments up the side are 200 PSI each. So you start at zero, zero, two, four, six, eight, a thousand. And the time increments going left to right are five minutes. Notice the square marked number one. That is very significant. Just to the left of that green line, you see the vertical line, and that's where they were dropping the pressure to get to zero. And as it got to, I'm, my clock says uh, 5.55, five, actually, yeah, 5.55 p.m. 
they had trouble bleeding off the last 200 PSI. And that's why you've got this little sloped line there at number one. The pressure would not bleed off. And in fact, the way they got pressure to bleed off was up with the cement unit. You would just open the valve and let off a little a barrel or so, gallons, barrels of fluid, and that would reduce the pressure. But when they got down to here, trying to get that last 200 PSI, they got 15 barrels, 15 barrels of extra fluid of the cement unit came back during that five minutes. Now, let's ask ourselves if, if getting 15 more barrels back than you should is significant. The first thing they did is they looked in the riser to make sure the closing pressure on the annular wasn't leaking once again. No, it wasn't leaking. The riser was full of mud. So the, that means the annular pressure was adequate. Nothing was leaking down past the annular. And therefore, we got 15 barrels of fluid of the cement unit that came from somewhere and we don't know where. Ask ourselves if that's significant. If you have a calculator at hand, take 15 barrels in five minutes and realize there are 1,440 minutes in a day, and you come up with a 4,000 barrel a day well. This well's making 4,000 barrels a day. At that number one, for those five minutes, this is the first absolute indicator that this well is flowing. Now notice at the end of that five minutes, at 1800 hours, kind of hidden behind the blue arrow at number one, there's a vertical line. That vertical line is where they closed the valve at the cement unit. They closed the valve of the cement unit and that happened to be at 1800, which is 6 p.m., which also happened to be the crew changed time for the two company men on the rig. So one went off duty, one came on duty. They closed that valve. They had that 15 barrels of unexplained fluid and they closed that valve and they had a big powwow about what was going on. And they decided that because that was anomalous, they decided to abort negative pressure test number one and go to negative pressure, pressure test number two. But let me, let me offer this to you. At 6 p.m., down by the number one, they close that valve. You see the vertical line. Do you reckon if that well was producing 4,000 barrels a day into the well bore, that that producing formation had any idea that somebody closed the valve three and a half miles away? It's three and a half miles from the formation up to the cement unit. Somebody closed the valve at the cement unit so they could have a powwow. Do you think the formation knew that? No, the formation did not know that. The formation kept flowing. In fact, as it flowed, notice what happens to that green line. The pressure of the green line suddenly is at 200 PSI, at 400 PSI, 600, 800, 1,000, all the way up to 1,400 PSI. So the formation is flowing into the closed well bore. It's closed to the top because the cement, the valve of the cement unit is closed. It's open at the bottom for whatever reason, we don't know, but there's your pressure buildup curve all the way up to 1400 PSI. If we had been drilling a well and we took a kick and we shut it in and we saw a similar increase in pressure on the drill pipe and it stabilized at 1400 PSI, we would call that the SIDPP, shut in drill pipe pressure, which is a measure of how much underbalanced the, the NPT combination of water and mud is compared to the formation. We just have a, we have a kick right here in progress and it's in view on this chart. We don't see it because we're getting ready to go to NPT2. Now, this well, don't forget, NPT1 is a simulation of what would happen if we had 8,000 feet of seawater in this well bore. This is exactly what would happen. Well would kick and it would have a shut in drill pipe pressure of 1400 PSI. All we have to do is open the BOPs and this all this goes away. 
Because if we open the BOPs, guess what? If you open the BOPs, the well now sees a full well bore of heavy mud. So let's go to the next slide. And this is called NPT number two. Are we on the same slide? Lower right hand corner says 15. This is the NPT, NPT2 slide. Okay, some things are missing when we do NPT2. We've got the kill line full of, full of uh, seawater. But there's some things happening here that, that the data says should have been, been seen. Remember when we said if we fill the kill line with seawater that we are going to underbalance the formation by about 450 PSI? Well, if we have a kick coming up the drill pipe that's 1400 PSI underbalance, we should be seeing a kick that's coming up the kill line that's 450 PSI, but we don't. And that's number five, that's the dashed line. We don't see that, it should be there. Something is wrong with the kill line. Maybe a valve at the bottom of the kill line right down at the BOP is closed. Wouldn't that be something? You're trying to run a negative pressure test through a kill line with a closed valve. But actually they did a test to make sure the kill line valve was open. Number six, notice there's a, there's a, a vertical line where the pressure's increasing and as it increases and it gets to about 450 PSI, the pressure breaks back. Notice the little slope in that line. That's like the slope you would get on a cement squeeze job. You pressure up, let, it see, let the cement harden a little bit and pressure up again and suddenly it takes more cement and the pressure breaks back. This is a typical break back when the formation is taking fluid. So when they tried to pressure test the kill line, they actually got up to about 450 PSI and the pressure broke back and noticed in the sharp drop vertical line where the pressure went down to zero. And they were happy with this. Notice number seven, where the kill line pressure zero, you think, holy, what's going on here? What we discover is that while we were preparing, the well for production. And preparing the rig for abandonment. We had to get rid of all the heavy oil-based mud on the rig. We also had to get rid of some leftover lost circulation materials. We had about 400 barrels of two different kinds of lost circulation materials, 16 pound per gallon. It was water-based. And they decided to pump that down the riser to just above the BOPs, so that when ultimately it was time to displace the riser with seawater, that big slug of, of lost circulation material would act as a piston, helping the seawater to lift the piston to lift the heavy mud out of the riser. Well, remember when we had closing pressure problems with the annular BOP and the fluid level in the riser fell? two or three times while we we're trying to get the closing pressure right. Well, every time the fluid level in the drilling riser fell, that LCM, the lost circulation material that started off above the BOP, ended up in the BOP. And that's where the opening to the kill line is. So what we've got here is at number five, we've got the LCM plugging the kill line and, and you might wonder how can it do that with well, a kill line is three and a 16th, 15,000 PSI rated pipe with a very small hole in the middle and kill line or lost circulation materials are designed to plug kill line, designed to plug holes. The kill line is just one other small hole. So even though we couldn't see the 450 pound kick because the kick pressure wasn't high enough to pump the LCM up the kill line, when we put the pumps at the top of the kill line, it didn't take a whole lot of effort to pump down the kill line and just push the LCM away from the end of the kill line. And that's what we see at number six. So the LCM is blocking the kill line from showing us 
that we've got a valid negative pressure test. So at number seven, with arrow points to zero PSI, they held that for 30 minutes and declared NPT2 successful. Let's go to the next slide. Now here's our problem. We, this says, in the lower right hand corner, it says slide 16. The white slide is diagram 20. As we are pumping, we're gonna displace the well with seawater now because we've got a good negative pressure test. It shows there's no leak from the outside in. Unfortunately, that's wrong data. We're basing our displacement on a, on a bad decision on the second negative pressure test. The first negative pressure test showed the well to be flowing. We aborted that. The second negative pressure, pressure test, all it said was that that test was invalid, but we considered it valid, and therefore we said we got a good negative pressure test, and now we're going to displace the well with seawater. So on the left of this diagram, we see we're pumping seawater down the drill pipe and out the end. And as seawater exits the drill pipe and moves up along the outside of the drill pipe, we've got less and less heavy mud left in the wellbore and riser, and therefore there's less U2 pressure. So as we're displacing seawater into the well and heavy mud out, the drill pipe pressure decreases. But there came a time when we got rid of so much heavy mud in the well bore and the riser and replaced it with seawater that we finally reduced the bottom hole pressure to equal the formation pressure. And as soon as we pumped one more barrel of seawater, the well started to flow. Now look at way at the bottom of the middle picture. We've got hydrocarbons coming into the well bore, and they're moving up the well bore, pushing heavy mud up toward the drill pipe. So I've got, I'm pumping seawater down the drill pipe, but my formation is pushing heavy mud up the casing. And because of that underbalance, because of the well flowing, the drill pipe pressure starts increasing. It starts increasing. So when we started our displacement process, we noticed that the drill pipe pressure was decreasing. But there came a time when the drill pipe pressure started increasing. That was the first indicator we had that the well was actually flowing because of the seawater we're pumping into the well bore. Let's go to the next slide. So this is the same slide, I'm just honing in on the picture on the right. The flow kept coming and kept displacing heavy mud and seawater and the lost circulation material up the riser. And we've got 700, and it took 750 barrel kick plus 1500 barrels in the riser and we still don't know the well's kicking. Guys, if we take a kick on a drilling rig, a 10 barrel kick, that is significant. A 100 barrel kick, that's big time. This is a kick that comprised 750 barrels in the casing plus 1500 barrels in the riser before we knew it was happening. Now what ultimately happened as the hydrocarbons moved up the well bore, around the drill pipe, through the open BOP, and into the riser, the shallowest hydrocarbons finally got to a depth where the hydrostatic head was low enough that the gas in solution reached the bubble point and expanded explosively. So the first indicator they got on the rig, the very first indicator wasn't a pressure reading, it was an eruption of water and mud, and within seconds, oil and gas through the rig floor up over the derrick. 
that was the indicator the well is kicking. Now, we're not able to ask the guys what they did because everybody on the rig floor were part of the fatality list of 11 people. But forensic evidence in September of 2010 showed that they had closed two BOPs, kind of on an emergency situation, obviously. Those two closed BOPs, one was an annular and one was a variable bore ram. Now, when they closed the annular, they closed it immediately as quick as they could because they had all this stuff flowing right through the rig floor. It hadn't caught fire yet. But when they closed that annular, nothing happened, nothing changed. So we're guessing that's why they closed the VBR and still nothing happened, nothing changed. And why is that? And this is a very, very important point about deep water drilling. When your BOPs are on the seafloor and you've got a massive riser between the BOPs and the rig, and that riser is full of oil and gas, and it's erupting through the rig, when you close the BOPs, yeah, you now have prevented anything else from coming in the well. The BOPs have definitely closed off the well. There's no new fluids coming in. Everything below the BOPs may be hydrocarbons, but it's not coming up the well bore. But what about the oil and gas that's in the riser? It's below the bubble point. It's erupting and expanding and it's autocatalytic and it's coming and it's in your face and suddenly it's on fire. And it just kept coming. It kept coming to such an extent that it not only destroyed everything on the rig floor, but it brought down the blocks out of the derrick. And when the blocks fall down out of the derrick, what do they land on? They land on the top of the drill pipe. Now, even though the BOPs are closed around the drill pipe, the blocks from the derrick have just fallen on the top of the drill pipe, so now it's wide open. So now my flow from the reservoir is up through the casing, up through the drill pipe now, it can't come through the BOPs because they're closed, but it's coming through the drill pipe right up to the rig floor, right up to the rig floor, and there's nothing to stop it. So let's go to the next slide. Because those two BOPs were closed, something happened that doesn't normally happen in a well control situation. Now we have to realize this is an ultra, ultra violent well control situation. We have 1,500 barrels of oil and gas explosively decompressing in the riser, blowing out and burning on the rig. And that very big pressure differential from underneath the BOPs to on top of the BOPs is also trying to blow that drill pipe right back up the hole. It would love to just blow that drill pipe to ungrip it from the BOPs and blow it out of the hole. It couldn't do that. But what it did do is it pushed it up the hole as far as it could. In the forensic analysis of the BOPs in September of 2010, they found more drill pipe between the annular BOP and the closed variable bore ram than would normally fit there. So let's say it was 40 feet, I'm, I'm just guessing. They found 45 feet of pipe in the 45 foot interval. Well, that buckled pipe played an important role because in the emergency disconnect sequence of events to try to get the riser and the top annular to release from the BOP so the rig can get away from this burning well, it would not release because part of the sequence of events of the emergency release system is for the blind shear ram to close, to cut whatever's in there, in this case, drill pipe, close, cut the drill pipe, shear and seal, but it could not do that. And therefore the emergency disconnect would not work. And the reason that blind shear ram could not close is because the pipe between the annular and the VBR was so badly buckled and they found this to be true in the forensic exam. They're looking at it with their eyes saying, holy cow, look at that. We have more pipe in here than fits in here. So 
literally within minutes of the first indication of a kick, you got explosions and fire throughout the rig. 11 people uh, were killed, 115 survived, though I can tell you this, almost half of those guys are severely disabled even to this day. The rig sank a day and a half, days, a day and a half later. The well flowed for 86 days, almost three months, almost 5 million barrels of oil and gas into the Gulf of Mexico. That picture behind me on the screen is in fact a picture of the burning rig. And uh, that happens to be my screensaver on my desktop. And I use it as my back screen for this presentation. Now on the next slide, let's look at some factors that contributed to the cause of the blowout. Obviously, the rat hole contributed. If the rat hole, if we had followed procedures, and let me tell you what that procedure is. There is a procedure that calls for spotting a pill, like 10 barrels, of heavy mud in the rat hole before we pull the bit out of the hole and run the casing. We want that rat hole to be full of heavy mud. And in fact, this recommendation has been around since I used to drill wells. It's called an API RP, RP for recommended practice. API RP 67 section 7.5 says that if you have rat hole, you need to spot heavy mud in the rat hole or the lightweight mud in the rat hole will displace itself with the heavyweight cement above it when you run casing. Guys, that's been around for decades. They didn't do that on this well. So the rat hole contributed. It contaminated the cement to such an extent, the oil and gas from the pay zone was able to find its way down the annulus and up through the shoe track because this path was contaminated. The float collar, had the float collar been, uh, forgot the word, um, I forgot the word for what we do to the float collar. If we had action to the float collar so the flappers worked, then uh, uh, that certainly those check valves could have prevented any kind of flow. Backflowing the well, that's the 15 barrels. Backflowing the well, that certainly contributed to the cause of the blowout. How about unseen forensic data? Now this is where the petroleum engineers can really step forward because there's a tremendous amount of data that we haven't looked at in this short presentation. You know, you got um, amounts of seawater pumped, amounts of fluid that went, were released overboard, uh, pressures on the drill pipe, pressures on the annulus. Um, so we've got tr a tremendous amount of unseen forensic data that in hindsight might allow us to better refine the cause of the blowout. What about the LCM and the BOP? That played a very big role. It made NPT2 look good when in fact it wasn't good. And simultaneous operations, what was that? That was the fact that we were trying to get rid of the oil-based mud. That's why we put the LCM in the BOP. That's what we were moving mud from pit to pit on the rig, pumping mud from, from the rig down to the boat to get rid of the mud. Uh, those simultaneous operations had people busy doing things that kept them from being able to count barrels of seawater going into the well, barrels of mud coming out of the well, and guess what? They need to be the same. If you're putting in more than getting out, you've got lost circulation somewhere. If you're getting out more than you're putting in, guess what? Something's flowing. So simultaneous operations definitely contributed to the cause of the blowout. Let's go to the next slide. Now, what are some of the factors that actually caused the blowout? One, we had a viable NPT, negative pressure test result, that confirmed a leak and the well's flow potential went under balance. That was absolutely NPT1. That was a little 15 barrel flow and the pressure buildup curve and the fact that it just happened to settle out at the SIDPP, the shut-in drill pipe pressure that just perfectly matched how much underbalanced our fluid column was compared to the formation pressure. Number two is the lack of the primate 
primary cement plug barrier. Wait a minute, didn't we set a cement plug barrier? Oh, it turns out, no, we didn't set it. We were going to set 300 foot cement plug, but we didn't get to that. We decided to run, uh, we decided to abort NPT1, which would have been followed by the cement plug, but we aborted cement, we, we aborted NPT1 and went to NPT2 and just kind of gave up on the cement plug. We also missed the, the viable pump pressure data where we had drill pipe pressure decreasing and suddenly for some reason it started increasing. We missed that. And then we also, things that caused the blowout was the, the massive, massive unchecked flow of hydrocarbons coming up the well bore before we all ever knew there was a kick. We had, we had more than a thousand barrels of hydrocarbons above the BOPs and, and just that violent flow is what debilitated the BOPs when we closed an annular and a VBR. Next slide. So we've got a few more slides to go. Don't get excited. Um, when we say conclusions, we're talking about there is blowout, the blowout evidence is defined by, and, and this is why we're, we are talking to each other. These are basic petroleum measuring concepts. Now, I have said on many occasions in answer to Q&A, this is one of the few times, one of the few situations where guess what? Every aspect of petroleum engineering you can imagine comes into play in trying to understand the cause of this blowout. So we have coursework and we've got reservoir production, drilling, uh, concepts and training and responsibilities, all petroleum engineering related, but it's all basic stuff. And unfortunately, it, it, it tears me up to think that all we had to do is apply those concepts in fact, sometimes, in, one, in some cases, any one of the concepts would have made a difference on a condo. Also helpful, and simultaneously, throughout industry, we have an awful lot of people and committees and academic institutions not looking at the cause of the blowout as we have today. Very few people, very, very few, are taking the time that you have taken today to try to understand the cause because they're all looking at offshore process safety, drilling process safety, safety and environmental management systems, real-time data, human factors. Those things are all important. But guys, you can study those forever and then go offshore. And unless you know the petroleum engineering concepts, you're in trouble. Because those things may be well and good for how you organize companies and safety training programs, but they, they are not going to stop. They are not going to replace the engineers looking at data on the rig. But here's a big but. What is that but for? Next slide it says, but how do we apply what we've learned from a condo to future drilling wells? So guys, maybe more important than truly, truly understanding the nuances of the cause of the Macondo blowout is how do we apply it to future wells? That's what you're gonna take back to class. That's what you're gonna to take to your first job. That's what you're gonna to take to your first well and for every well you ever drill thereafter. So let's look at this. A well from mobilization to demobilization. That means from the time we pick up the rig, the time we get rid of the rig, from rigging up to rigging down is a sequence of processes. You could say it's all one big process, but that's a pretty big process. Let's kind of break it down and say, it's actually a sequence of little processes. And each of those processes have steps to be executed. But when something interrupts any one of those processes, whatever is broken needs to be fixed. And that's a fundamental concept that we do not always adhere to. We need to understand why it's so important. If we look at any drilling project, we can say, well, let's, what are some of the processes we're talking about? Well, well, running casing would be a process. It has a beginning and a middle and an end. A completely different process might be testing the BOPs. Another process might be installing a wellhead. Another might be drilling to the next casing point or testing the casing. Those are each processes. What is an interruption? Anything, anything is unplanned or unexpected. 
when you're installing a wellhead, you know exactly the steps to be taken. We're going to do step A, and then B, and C, D, E, F, G. And when you get done with all those, you've installed the wellhead. But if we have something that's unplanned or unexpected, A, B, C, X, ah, you better stop. That's interrupted. Our goal is to figure out what's wrong and to fix it. So here's an example. What if we're drilling ahead? We're on the rig floor, and you guys are going to be on this rig someday soon, if you haven't already. You're drilling ahead. Everything's going well. You're 10,000 feet, and you're drilling at 100 feet an hour, and you're very happy with what's going on. And suddenly, there's a high-pitched screaming alarm. What we know for sure is something changed. What does the driller do? Almost always, he stops drilling. Uh oh stop drilling because we may well have a well control event. This well may be kicking and we are going to jump on that as quick as we can. But let me ask you this. Okay, are you on the same slide I'm on, 25, lower right? Okay, we have just finished that slide. Now let's go to the next, next slide. And here's our same drilling ahead example when the alarm screams and we stop drilling, guys, it's not necessarily a well control problem. It could be a washout or a bit failure or a pack off or lost circulation or something else. It is incumbent on us. The yellow box says, we not only need to stop drilling, but we need to figure out what's wrong so we fix the right problem. We've got to fix the right problem. It's not just a matter of stopping drilling. We've got to figure out what the problem is and fix it. I want to call this next slide. I want to call this process a process interruption protocol. It's not necessarily a new term, but it is a new term from my perspective for drilling wells because I haven't seen it anywhere else. But I'll tell you who uses it. NASA uses it. Airlines use it. Think about Captain Sullenberger when he landed that plane in the river. A bunch of geese or ducks, whatever they were, took out the engines. He didn't have time to figure out Anything other than, okay, I know I've got a problem. I've got to fix that problem. I need to land this plane. I think I'll land it in that river. And he was done. What about on Apollo 13 when the oxygen tank failed? And they were on a mere 200,000 miles from Earth. That's called process interruption. All they wanted to do was go from A to B in their, in their craft, but the oxygen tank failed. They had to fix that. We call that process interruption protocol. So if a process is interrupted, the protocol says we must stop the process, resolve the interruptive data. What was the data? What does the data say that caused the interruption and remediate the problem? What would happen if we had to use the process interruption protocol on the negative pressure test? First of all, what was the process? In as simple terms as we can imagine, the negative pressure test, we're, we're talking about NPT1, we're gonna run drill pipe, we're gonna fill the drill pipe with seawater and close the BOPs, and we're gonna bleed the trapped YouTube pressure to zero and hold it for 30 minutes. Wow, that's an easy negative pressure test. Ah, but it got interrupted. It got interrupted because the pressure wouldn't bleed off and it made 15 barrels. That's an interruption because when you look back up at process, there's no part of that process. Run drill pipe, fill with seawater, close BOPs, bleed trap pressure zero, hold. No part of that process says the pressures wouldn't bleed or make 15 barrels. What does the protocol say? It says stop the process. Stop NPT1. Resolve the interruptive data. What's the interruptive data? The fact that the pressure wouldn't bleed and made 15 barrels and remediate the problem. Or figure out what's wrong and fix it. So if you go back to this dive, next slide, please. One more. One more slide. All right, no, there you go. Look at number one down there. Number one is where NPT1 got interrupted because 
the pressure at number one would not reduce from 200 to zero and it made 15 barrels. That's where we would have not only closed the valve as a cement unit, but we would have given zero consideration to NPT2 because we need to figure out what happened, what caused the well to make 15 barrels. Let's go to the next slide. So our lesson learned is, the Macondo lesson learned is, if we can stop the process and resolve the interruptive data and remediate the problem, it's a done deal. That's what would have happened to Macondo. There would have been no well-controlled problem. How is this applicable to what we do from now on for forever? Your wells worldwide, any well, anywhere, onshore, offshore, any process, deep or shallow, driving your car, flying an airplane, I don't care what. If you have a known sequence of events that should happen that define the process you're in the middle of and something interrupts it, guys, you got to stop. Take a look. And fix the problem. Our goal is to minimize the chance of ever losing control of another well. Our last slide. Um, I'm going to give you some time for Q&A, but there's one slide after this that I think is kind of interesting for you. We'll have a, two slides later. That's it right there. The Japanese have a saying, it says, fix the problem, not the blame. And that's one of the things that went through my mind from the beginning of my uh, analysis of all those depositions and all the data uh, that I was able to download and asking questions and was, guys, we need to understand what the problem was so we can fix it. Not matter, it doesn't matter who's at fault, it doesn't matter the blame. So that concludes my remarks. And if we back up a couple slides, um, or one slide, back up one slide, there you go. Uh, I will be glad to take some Q&A. I might take a drink of water first. Sure. Uh, let me take uh, the time to... Uh, wow, <laughs> what a very detailed visualization of what happened. Thank you for it. It was very detailed. Uh, uh, description of John. As uh, John Bosco, one of the attendees, has commented, uh, I'm in love with the, with this presentation. It makes me see myself, uh, the rig, and analyzing everything in uh, real time. So that's the feedback we're having today. Very good. And yeah, thank you so much. So let's start with the questions. Um, the first question we have is, uh, why didn't uh, a CBL or a VDL uh, log uh, uh, was available or, or was run for this? That's a very good question. And I'm going to give you two, two answers for that. One is <clears throat> there is a procedure, a procedure on the rig that says when we are cementing the Macondo well, if any of these things go wrong, we're going to have to abort the cement job and run a CBL to figure out where our cement went. That was a procedure on the rig. None of those things went wrong. There was no requirement for a CBL. The CBL in this case, if we had run a CBL, the first thing you would have had to do, by the way, to run a CBL is you'd have to go in this well and drill out the flow collar. Now guys, I don't want to do that. I don't want to drill out the flow color that's necessary in order for the well to be secure when we abandon it. So there are many reasons for not running the CBL. And the only good reason for running a CBL is if you're trying to prove something is so wrong with the cement job that you're, you're afraid of continuing with your program. Now, at the time they ran casing, and at the time they ran cement, and at the time you even considered a CBL, nobody was even whispering a word about this well is going to blow out. There was nothing going on wrong. They drilled a well. They ran casing. They ran cement. 
Nothing failed on the cement job. During the displacement of the cement, they lost a few barrels of fluid, but the location of the cement slurry at the time they lost the fluid was not even past the float collar yet. So they did not lose any cement in the well, and there's no reason to run a CBL. Now, the second part of my answer, and it may be the reason why the question was asked is, in the early days of assessing the blowout, there were a lot of high positioned people who were in Senate conferences, what have you. And, and uh, there were claims like you didn't run enough centralizers and you didn't circulate bottoms up and you didn't run a CBL. Well, if you think about those things right now, based on what you have just heard about the cause of the blowout, there's nothing about a CBL that would have caused, let's say you'd run a CBL down to the top of the flow collar, nothing would have changed. You still had the rat hole contamination, you still had a failed flow collar, so nothing would have changed. How about centralizers, running centralizers? What, what would running centralizers have done? It might have centered the casing better in the hole, but you were still had the rat hole percolation, you still had the contamination, you still had the failed flow collar. So my approach on all of this has been to look at the data of the things that actually contributed to the cause of the blowout. And this, whether or not we ran or did not run a CBL uh, did not contribute to the happening of the blowout. Now, I'm guessing that at least a number of you have or will sometime maybe even through your petroleum engineering department, watch the movie called Deepwater Horizon. It's a really good movie. I saw it three times. The third time I saw it, I was MC of the petroleum engineering department at Colorado School of Mines where we all watched the movie and then had Q&A. And I give my assessment of that movie in three parts. The people, the technology, and the, and the cinematics. One of the first thing you notice in the movie is the captain of the work boat, when he is interviewed said, did you know they did not run a CBL? Now where in the world would the captain of the work boat have ever come up with that? So it was something inane in the movie. I love the movie, it's worth seeing. Every patrol engineer should see the movie. But the captain of the work boat ask why they didn't run a CBL. The galley hand, the steward asked why did they didn't run a CBL. The mechanical, the, the chief mechanic who works down in the engine room said, you know what, we didn't run a CBL. I would venture to say that between the company man and the geologists out there, they're the only ones out there who even knew what a CBL was. So the movie made a big deal about the CBL and that's why there are a lot of questions even today about why didn't they run the CBL? I hope that answered your question with not too much pontification. Next. Yeah. So we have another question. What's uh, LCM? What does it mean? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry for that abbreviation. LCM is lost circulation material. It's the gunky stuff that uh, when they were originally drilling the well and they they uh, had lost circulation right above the discovery zone they would pump this gunk the lost circulation material down the drill pipe up the annulus and let it block off the lost circulation zone and it is also the stuff that was left over at the end of the well about 400 barrels of it comprised of two different kinds of unrelated lcm that uh, were combined together to form one big mass of gunk that eventually plugged the kill line that made negative pressure test number two look good. So pardon my abbreviation. No problem. Um, another question we can have is, uh, what problem they had in bleeding DP in NPT1? I'm sorry, you're asking what, 
uh, we have a question. Uh, what problem they had in bleeding DP in NPT1? Okay, well, the problem with, uh, you're saying when they were bleeding off the pressure for NPT1, what problem did they have? Yeah. Well, that's, that's what we talked about when we said we, we reduced the U-tube pressure on the drill pipe. We closed the BOP, and that means the bottom of the hole saw nine or 8,000 feet of seawater on top of 10,000 feet of heavy mud. And when we bled that pressure off, it caused the bottom hole pressure to be reduced so dramatically that it literally sucked production from the discovery zone down the annulus, up the casing, through the flow collar, and into the casing. So that was the consequence of NPT-1, is we actually sucked on the reservoir hard enough to get it to finally break through the contaminated cement and the tight annulus, and come up the casing, and, and make a clear path. I hope that answers that question. Sure. So another question we have uh, is maybe a little clarification to the YouTube effect. Yes. Um, they're wondering what's the YouTube? What does YouTube mean in itself? Oh, I'm, oh I understand. Okay. If you um, if you when we ran the drill pipe. Let's, let's just say 100 feet of drill pipe. And we have mud inside and mud outside. Then if you measured the pressure on the drill pipe, it would be zero. But if you start pumping water into the drill pipe, now we have more pressure outside the pipe than inside the pipe. So if you imagine drawing the path of the pressure down through the heavy stuff and up the pipe through the lightweight stuff, that's the U we're talking about. Okay, great. It's kind of a U-shaped pressure path from high pressure on the outside to low pressure on the inside. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, John. Uh, it was a very informative uh, session. I'm sure uh, everyone was excited to hear what happened in this famous uh, incident, especially <laughs> the way you, uh, the, the very detailed uh, way you explained it to us. Uh, I'm passing you all the appreciation and gratitude of all the attendees. And uh, hopefully uh, we can have another session with you uh, soon in the future. You're very welcome, and I, I am more than open to additional uh, questions uh, as they come up. If the audience uh, uh, gets back in their classrooms and, and talks about this, and um, you know, it's it's my pleasure to uh, continue to uh, supply uh, answers to your questions. So uh, just let me know. Sure, we will be collecting more questions after uh, the session uh, via uh, Facebook and all the channel, and uh, we'll be sending them your way. Reem, thank you very much for uh, moderating uh, this, and uh, I'm sorry that the uh, uh, we had a little problem with the uh, uh, meeting. I was unable to use my pointer, and therefore... Uh, I no, 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 not at all. It, uh, it went very good, and... Uh, the way you say it, uh, explained it all. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. My pleasure. Everybody stay safe during these COVID days and uh, put your masks back on. <laughs>